Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg. Welcome to Book Spot. This time we will continue reading The Star Beast by Robert Heinlein. The beast in question, Lummox, is in trouble with the law, and he has been brought to the courthouse. To it, but not into it, because he's too big to fit. His owner, Johnny, does fit in and is facing the judge. Greenberg said gently, We seem to have trimmed it down to indispensables now. We have several issues before us, but they have in common the same sheaf of facts. Unless there is objection, we will hear testimony for all issues together, then pass on the issues one at a time. Objection? The lawyers looked at each other. Finally, Mr. Ito's attorney said, Your Honor, it would seem to me to be fairer to try them one at a time. Possibly, but if we do, we'll be here till Christmas. I dislike to make so many busy people go over the same ground repeatedly. But a separate trial of the facts to a jury is your privilege. Bearing in mind, if you lose, your principal will have to bear the added cost alone. Mr. Ito's son tugged at the sleeve of the lawyer and whispered to him. The lawyer nodded and said, We'll go along with the joint hearing as to facts. Very well. Further objection? There was none. Greenberg turned to O'Farrell. Judge, is this room equipped with truth meters? Eh? Why, yes. I hardly ever use them. I like them. He turned to the others. Truth meters will be hooked up. No one is required to use one, but anyone choosing not to will be sworn. This court, as is its privilege, will take judicial note of and will comment on the fact if anyone refuses the use of a truth meter. John Thomas whispered to Betty, Watch your step, slugger, she whispered back. I will, smarty, you watch yours. Judge O'Farrell said to Greenberg, It will take some time to rig them. Hadn't we better break for lunch? Oh, yes, lunch. Attention, everyone, this court does not recess for lunch. I'll ask the bailiff to take orders for coffee and sandwiches or whatever you like while the clerk is rigging the meters. We will eat here at the table. In the meantime, Greenberg fumbled for cigarettes, fumbled again. Has anybody got a match? Out on the lawn, Lummox, having considered the difficult question of Betty's right to give orders, had come to the conclusion that she possibly had a special status. Each of the John Thomases had introduced into his life a person equivalent to Betty. Each had insisted that the person in question must be humored in every whim. This John Thomas had already begun the process with Betty, therefore it was best to go along with what she wanted as long as it was not too much trouble. He lay down and went to sleep, leaving his watchman eye on guard. He slept restlessly, disturbed by the tantalizing odor of steel. After a time, he woke up and stretched, causing the cage to bulge. It seemed to him that John Thomas had gone an unnecessarily long time. On second thought, he had not liked the way that man had taken John Thomas away. No, he hadn't liked it a bit. He wondered what he should do, if anything. What would John Thomas say if he were here? The problem was too complex. He lay down and tasted the bars of his cage. He refrained from eating them. He merely tried them for flavor. A bit grucky, he decided, but good. Inside, Chief Dressier had completed his testimony and had been followed by Carnes and Mendoza. No argument had developed, and the truth meters had stayed steady. Mr. DeGrasse had insisted on amplifying parts of the testimony. Mr. Ito's lawyer stipulated that Mr. Ito had fired at Lummox. Mr. Ito's son was allowed to describe and show photographs of the consequences. Only Mrs. Donahue's testimony was needed to complete the story of L. Day. Greenberg turned to her lawyer. Mr. Beanfield, will you examine your client, or shall the court continue? Go ahead, Your Honor. I may add a question or two. Your privilege. Mrs. Donahue, tell us what happened. I certainly shall. Your Honor, friends, distinguished visitors, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, nevertheless, in my modest way, I believe I... Never mind that, Mrs. Donahue. Just the facts. Last Monday afternoon. But I was. Very well. Go ahead. Keep it simple. She sniffed. Well, I was lying down, trying to catch a few minutes rest. I have so many responsibilities, clubs and charitable committees and things. 
Greenberg was watching the truth meter over her head. The needle wobbled restlessly, but did not kick over into the red enough to set off the warning buzzer. He decided that it was not worthwhile to caution her. When suddenly I was overcome with a nameless dread, the needle swung far into the red, a ruby light flashed, and the buzzer gave out a loud, rude noise. Somebody started to giggle. Greenberg said hastily, order in the court, the bailiff is instructed to remove any spectator making a disturbance. Mrs. Donahue broke off suddenly when the buzzer sounded. Mr. Beanfield, looking grim, touched her sleeve and said, Never mind that, dear lady. Just tell the court about the noise you heard and what you saw and what you did. He's leading the witness, objected Betty. Never mind, said Greenberg. Somebody has to. But objection overruled. Witness will continue. Well, um... I heard this noise, and I wondered what in the world it was. I peeked out, and there was this great ravening beast charging back and forth, and the buzzer sounded again. A dozen spectators laughed. Mrs. Donahue said angrily, Will somebody shut that silly thing off? How can anyone be expected to testify with that going on is more than I can see. Order, called Greenberg. If there is more demonstration, the court will find it necessary to hold someone in contempt. He went on to Mrs. Donahue. Once a witness has accepted the use of the truth meter, the decision cannot be changed, but the data supplied by it is instructive merely. The court is not bound by it. Continue. Well, I should hope so. I never told a lie in my life. The buzzer remained silent. Greenbird reflected that she must believe it. I mean, he added, that the court makes up its own mind. It does not allow a machine to do so for it. My father always said that gadgets like that were the spawn of the devil. He said that an honest businessman should not please Mrs. Donahue. Mr. Beanfield whispered to her. Mrs. Donahue went on more quietly. Well, there was that thing, that enormous beast kept by that boy next door. It was eating my rose bushes. And what did you do? I didn't know what to do. I grabbed the first thing at hand, a broom it was, and rushed out the doors. The beast came charging at me and bzzz, Shall we go over that again, Mrs. Donahue? Well, anyhow, I rushed at it and began to beat it on the head. It snapped at me, those great teeth. Bzzz. Then what happened, Mrs. Donahue? Well, it turned away, the cowardly thing, and ran out of my yard. I don't know where it went, but there was my lovely garden just ruined. The needle quivered, but the buzzer did not sound. Greenberg turned to the lawyer. Mr. Beanfield, have you examined the damage to Mrs. Donahue's garden? Yes, Your Honor. Will you tell us the extent of the damage? Mr. Beanfield decided that he would rather lose a client than be buzzed in open court by that confounded toy. Five bushes were eaten, Your Honor, in whole or in part. There was minor damage to the lawn and a hole made in an ornamental fence. Financial damage? Mr. Beanfield said carefully, the amount we are suing for is before you, Your Honor. That is not responsive, Mr. Beanfield. Mr. Beanfield shrugged mentally and struck Mrs. Donahue off his list of paying properties. Oh, around a couple of hundred, Your Honor, in property damage, but the court should allow for inconvenience and mental anguish, Mrs. Donahue yelped. That's preposterous! My prize roses! The needle jumped and fell back too quickly to work the buzzer. Greenberg said wearily, What prizes, Mrs. Donahue? Her lawyer cut in. They were right next to Mrs. Donahue's well-known champion plants. Her courageous action saved the more valuable bushes, I am happy to say. Is there more to add? I think not. I have photographs marked and identified to offer. Very well. Mrs. Donahue glared at her lawyer. Well, I also have something to add. There is one thing I insist on, absolutely insist on, and that is that that dangerous, bloodthirsty beast be destroyed. Greenberg turned to Beanfield. Is that a formal prayer, Counselor, or may we regard it as rhetoric? Beanfield looked uncomfortable. We have such a petition, Your Honor. The court will receive it. Betty butted in with, Hey, wait a minute! All Lummy did was eat a few of her measly old... Later, Miss Sorensen. But later, please, you will have your chance. The court is now of the opinion that it has all the pertinent facts. Does anyone have any new facts to bring out, or does anyone wish to discuss the question further or bring a witness? 
bring forward another witness. We do, Betty said at once. You do what? We want to call a new witness. Very well. Do you have him here? Yes, Your Honor. Just outside. Lummox. Greenberg looked thoughtful. Do I understand that you are proposing to put uh, Lummox on the stand in his own defense? Why not? He can talk. The reporter turned suddenly to a colleague and whispered to him, then hurried out of the room. Greenberg chewed his lip. I know that, he admitted. I exchanged a few words with him myself. But the ability to talk does not alone make a competent witness. A child may learn to talk after a fashion before it is a year old, but only rarely is a child of tender years, less than five, let us say, found competent to give testimony. The court takes judicial notice that members of non-human races, non-human in the biological sense, may give evidence, but nothing has been presented to show that this particular extraterrestrial is competent. John Thomas whispered worriedly to Betty, Have you slipped your cams? There's no telling what Lummy would say. Hush, she went on to Greenberg. Look, Mr. Commissioner, you've said a lot of fancy words, but what do they mean? You are about to pass judgment on Lummox, and you won't even bother to ask him a question. You say he can't give competent evidence. Well, we've seen others around here who didn't do so well. I'll bet if you took a truth meter to Lummy, it won't buzz. Sure, he did things he shouldn't have done. He ate some scrawny old rose bushes and he ate Mr. Ito's cabbages. What's horrible about that? When you were a kid, did you ever swipe a cookie when you thought nobody was looking? She took a deep breath. Suppose when you swiped that cookie, somebody hit you in the face with a broom or fired a gun at you. Wouldn't you be scared? Wouldn't you run? Lummy is friendly. Everybody around here knows that, or at least if they don't, they're stupider and more irresponsible than he is. But did anybody try to reason with him? Oh no, they bullied him and fired off guns at him and scared him to death and chased him off bridges. You say Lummy is incompetent. Who is incompetent? All these people who were mean to him or Lummy? Now they want to kill him. If a little boy swiped a cookie, I suppose they'd chop his head off just to make sure he wouldn't do it again. Is somebody crazy? What kind of farce is this? She stopped, tears running down her cheeks. It was a talent which had been useful in school dramatics. To her own surprise, she found that these tears were real. Are you through? asked Greenberg. I guess so, for now anyway. I must say you put it very movingly but a court should not be swayed by emotion. Is it your theory that the major portion of the damage, let us say everything but the roses and the cabbages, arose from improper acts of human beings and therefore cannot be charged to Lummox or his owner? Figure it yourself, Your Honor. The tail generally follows the dog. Why not ask Lummy how it looked to him? We'll get to that. On another issue, I cannot grant that your analogy is valid. We are dealing here not with a little boy, but with an animal. If this court should order the destruction of this animal, it would not be in a spirit of vengeance nor of punishment, for an animal is presumed not to understand such values. The purpose would be preventative, in order that a potential danger might not be allowed to develop into damage to life, limb, or property. Your little boy can be restrained by the arms of his nurse, but we are dealing with a creature weighing several tons, capable of crushing a man with a careless step. There is no parallel to your cookie-stealing small boy. There isn't, huh? That little boy can grow up and wipe out a whole city by pushing one teeny little button, so off with his head before he grows up. Don't ask him why he took the cookie. Don't ask anything. He's a bad boy. Chop off his head and save trouble. Greenberg found himself again biting his lip. He said... Is it your wish that we examine Lummox? I said so, didn't I? I'm not sure what you said. The court will consider it. Mr. Lombard said quickly, Objection, Your Honor. If this extraordinary... Hold your objection, please. Court will recess for ten minutes. All will remain. Greenberg got up and walked away. He took out a cigarette, found again that he had no light, stuck the pack back in his pocket. Blast the girl! He had had it figured out how to dispose of this case smoothly, with credit to the department and everybody satisfied, except the Stewart boy, but that could not be helped. The boy and this preposterous, precocious young mammal who had him under her wing, and under her thumb, too, he added. He could not allow this unique specimen to be destroyed, but he had meant to do it suavely, 
deny the petition of that old battle axe, since it was obviously from malice, and tell the police chief privately to forget the other one. The save the world for the Neanderthals petition didn't matter. But this cocky girl, by talking when she should have listened, was going to make it appear that a departmental court could be pushed into risking public welfare over a lot of sentimental anthropomorphic bosh. Confound her pretty blue eyes. They would accuse him of being influenced by those pretty blue eyes, too. Too bad the child wasn't homely. The animal's owner was responsible for the damage. There were a thousand strayed animal cases to justify a ruling, since this was not the planet Tenkora. That stuff about it being the fault of the persons who frightened him off was a lot of prattle. But the E.T., as a specimen for science, was worth far more than the damage. The decision would not hurt the boy financially. He realized that he had allowed himself to fall into a most unjudicial frame of mind. The defendant's ability to pay was not his business. Excuse me, Your Honor, please don't monkey with those things. He looked up, ready to snap somebody's head off, to find himself looking at the clerk of the court. He then saw that he had been fiddling with the switches and controls of the clerk's console. He snatched his hands away. Sorry. A person who doesn't understand these things, the clerk said apologetically, can cause an awful lot of trouble. True. Unfortunately true. He turned away sharply. The court will come to order. He sat down and turned at once to Miss Sorensen. The court rules that Lummox is not a competent witness. Betty gasped. Your Honor, you are being most unfair. Possibly. She thought for a moment. We want a change of venue. Where did you learn that word? Never mind, you had one when the department intervened. That ends it. Now keep quiet for a change. She turned red. You ought to disqualify yourself. Greenberg had intended to be calm, positively Olympian in his manner. He now found it necessary to take three slow breaths. Young lady, he said carefully, you have been trying to confuse the issue all day. There is no need for you to speak now. You have said too much already. Understand me? I have not. I will too, and I didn't either. What? Repeat that, please. She looked at him. No, I'd better take it back, or you'll be talking about contempt. No, no, I want to memorize it. I don't think I have ever heard quite so sweeping a statement. Never mind, just hold your tongue. If you know how, you'll be allowed to talk later. Yes, sir. He turned to the others. The court announced earlier that there would be due notice if we were to continue to terminer. The court sees no reason not to. Objection? The attorneys shifted uncomfortably and looked at each other. Greenberg turned to Betty. How about you? Me? I thought I wasn't allowed to vote. Shall we conclude these issues today? She glanced at John Thomas, then said dully, no objection. Then leaned to him and whispered, Oh, Johnny, I tried. He patted her hand under the table. I know you did, slugger. Greenberg pretended not to hear. He went on in a cold, official voice. This court has before it a petition asking for the destruction of the extraterrestrial lummox on the grounds that it is dangerous and uncontrollable. The facts have not sustained that view. The petition is denied. Betty gasped and squealed. John Thomas looked startled, then grinned for the first time. Order, please, Greenberg said mildly. We have here another petition to the same end, but for different reasons. He held up the one submitted by the Keep Earth Human League. This court finds itself unable to follow the alleged reasoning. Petition denied. We have four criminal charges. I am dismissing all four. The law requires the city attorney looked startled. But, Your Honor, if you have a point, will you save it? No criminal intent can be found here, which therefore would make it appear there could be no crime. However, constructive intent may appear where the law requires a man to exercise due prudence to protect others, and it is on this ground that these issues must be judged. Prudence is based on experience, personal or vicarious, not on impossible prescience. In the judgment of this court, the precautions taken were prudent in the light of experience. Experience up to last Monday afternoon, that is to say. He turned and addressed John Thomas. What I mean, young man, is this. 
Your precautions were prudent so far as you knew. Now you know better. If that beast gets loose again, it will go hard with you. John Thomas Swallow. Yes, sir. We have remaining the civil matters of damage. Here the criteria are different. The guardian of a minor or the owner of an animal is responsible for damage committed by that child or that animal, the law holding that it is better that the owner or guardian suffer than the innocent third party. Except for one point, which I will reserve for the moment, these civil actions fall under that rule. First, let me note that one or more of these issues asks for real, punitive, and exemplary damages. Punitive and exemplary damages are denied. There are no grounds. I believe that we have arrived at real damages in each case, and councils have so stipulated. As to costs, the Department of Spatial Affairs has intervened in the public interest. Costs will be borne by the department. Betty whispered, Good thing we homesteaded him. Look at those insurance vultures grin. Greenberg went on, I reserved one point. The question has been raised indirectly that this lummox may not be an animal, and therefore not a chattel but may be a sentient being within the meaning of the customs of civilization, and therefore his own master. Greenberg hesitated. He was about to add his bit to the custom of civilizations. He was anxious not to be overruled. We have long disavowed slavery. No sentient being may be owned. But if Lummox is sentient, what have we? May Lummox be held personally responsible? It would not appear that he has sufficient knowledge of our customs, nor does it appear that he is among us by his own choice. Are the putative owners, in fact, his guardians, and in that way responsible? Are these quest All questions turn on this. Is Lummox a chattel or a free being? This court expresses its opinion when it ruled that Lummox might not testify at this time. But this court is not equipped to render a final decision, no matter how strongly it may believe that Lummox is an animal. The court will therefore start proceedings on its own motion to determine the status of Lummox. In the meantime, the local authorities will take charge of Lummox and will be held responsible both for his safety and for public safety with respect to him. Greenberg shut up and sat back. A fly would have had his choice of open mouths. First to recover was the attorney for Western Mutual, Mr. Schneider. Your Honor, where does that leave us? I don't know. But see here, Your Honor, let's face the facts. Mrs. Stewart hasn't any property or funds that can be attached. She's the beneficiary of a trust. Same for the boy. We expected to levy against the beast itself. He will bring a good price in the proper market. Now you have, if you will permit me, upset the apple cart. If one of these scientific <clears throat> persons starts a long series of tests, years long perhaps, or throws doubt on the beast's status as a chattel, well, where should we look for relief? Should we sue the city? Lombard was on his feet instantly. Now look here, you can't sue the city. The city's one of the damaged parties. On that theory, order, Greenberg said sternly, None of these questions can be answered now. All civil actions will be continued until the status of Lummox is clarified. He looked at the ceiling. There is another possibility. It would seem that this creature came to earth in the trailblazer. If my memory of history serves, all specimens brought back by that ship were government property. If Lummox is a chattel, he may nevertheless not be private property. In that event, the source of relief may be a matter of more involved litigation. Mr. Schneider looked stunned. Mr. Lombard looked angry. John Thomas looked confused and whispered to Betty, What's he trying to say? Lummox belongs to me. Shh, Betty whispered. Oh, I told you we'd get out of this. Mr. Greenberg is a honey lamb. But hush up, we're ahead. Mr. Ito's son had kept quiet when, except when testifying. Now he stood up. Your Honor... Yes, Mr. Ito. I don't understand any of this. I'm just a farmer, but I, I do want to know one thing. Who's going to pay for my father's greenhouses? John Thomas got to his feet. I am, he said simply. Betty tugged at his sleeve. Sit down, you idiot. You hush up, Betty. You've talked enough. Betty hushed up. Mr. Greenberg, everybody else has been talking. Can I say something? Go ahead. 
I've listened to a lot of stuff all day. People trying to make out that Lomax is dangerous when he's not. People trying to have him killed just for spite. Yes, I mean you, Mrs. Donahue. Address the court, please, Greenberg said quietly. And I've heard you say a lot of things, too. I didn't follow all of them, but if you'll pardon me, sir, some of them struck me as pretty silly. Excuse me. No contempt intended, I'm sure. Well, take this about whether or not Lummox is a chattel, or whether he's bright enough to vote. Lummox is pretty bright. I guess nobody but me knows just how bright, but he's never had any education, and he's never been anywhere. But that hasn't anything to do with who he belongs to. He belongs to me, just the way I belong to him. We grew up together. Now, I know I'm responsible for that damage last Monday. Will you keep quiet, Betty? I can't pay for it now, but I'll pay for it. I... Just a moment, young man. The court will not permit you to admit liability without counsel. If this is your attention, the court will appoint counsel. You said I could have my say. Continue. Noted for the record that this is not binding. Sure, it's binding because I'm going to do it. Pretty soon my education trust comes due, and it would about cover it. I guess I can... John Thomas, his mother called out sharply. You'll do no such thing. Mother, you better keep out of this, too. I was just going to say... You're not going to say anything. Your Honor, he is... Order, Greenberg interrupted. None of this is binding. Let the lads speak. Thank you, sir. I was through anyway. But I've got something to say to you, sir, too. Lummy is timid. I can handle him because he trusts me. But if you think I'm going to let a lot of strangers poke him and prod him and ask him silly questions and put him through mazes and things, you just better think again, because I won't stand for it. Lummy is sick right now. He's had more excitement than is good for him. The poor thing... Lummox had waited for John Thomas longer than he liked because he was not sure where John Thomas had gone. He had seen him disappear in the crowd without being sure whether or not Johnny had gone into the big house nearby. He'd tried to sleep after he woke up the first time, but people had come poking around, and he'd had to wake himself up repeatedly because his watchman circuit did not have much judgment. Not that he thought of it that way. He was merely aware that he had come to with his alarms jangling time after time. At last, he decided that it was time he located John Thomas and went home. Figuratively, he tore up Betty's orders. After all, Betty was not Johnny. So he stepped up his hearing to search and tried to locate Johnny. He listened for a long time, heard Betty's voice several times, but he was not interested in Betty. He continued to listen. There was Johnny now. He tuned out everything else and listened. He was in the big house, all right. Hey, Johnny sounded just the way he did when he had arguments with his mother. Lummox spread his hearing a little and tried to find out what was going on. They were talking about things he knew nothing about, but one thing was clear. Somebody was being mean to Johnny. His mother? Yes, he heard her once, and he knew she had the privilege of being mean to Johnny, just as Johnny could talk mean to him, and it didn't really matter. But there was somebody else, several others, and not one of them had any such privilege. Lummox decided that it was time to act. He heaved to his feet. John Thomas got no further than his per peroration about the poor thing. There were screams and shouts from outside. Everybody in court turned to look. The noises got rapidly closer, and Mr. Greenberg was just going to send the bailiff to find out about it when suddenly it became unnecessary. The door to the courtroom bulged, then burst off its hinges. The front end of Lummox came in, tearing away part of the wall and ending with him wearing the door frame as a collar. He opened his mouth. Johnny, he piped. Lummox, cried his friend. Stand still. Stay right where you are. Don't move an inch. Of all the faces in the room, that of Special Commissioner Greenberg presented the most interesting mixed expression. So now, Lomax has entered the courtroom, kind of wearing it. We'll continue next time.